Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Um, it will, we'll go through this talk um, about a piece you won't have heard of before, I suspect, um, called Data Fabric, um, which is a platform at NatWest Markets. Um, NatWest Markets is part of the Royal Bank of Scotland group. Uh, with the investment bank within um, RBS. Um, and Data Fabric's a platform that we've built um, to address some of the core investment banking use cases that we're often uh, faced with. Um, so, um, so just a little bit about me, because um, you probably don't know who I am. Um, my name is Mike Folk, and I'm a director in the Royal Bank of Scotland. I'm a developer and an architect, um, and at the moment, I'm the development manager for this platform we call Data Fabric. Um, I've been in the industry for about 23 years, uh, working in various languages, and for about for the last 10 years in Java. Um, I've also worked in C++, I've worked in C Sharp, um, worked on Windows and worked on Linux, uh, mostly on electronic trading and risk management systems. Um, I still enjoy it. Um, I'm very passionate about doing things simply and doing things well. Um, and I feel very lucky to um, have had uh, an exciting career, uh, and I'm still here. So um, I started out programming on a BBC Model B computer in my, uh, in my brother's bedroom uh, that was bought for him, um, and uh, he got bored of it very quickly, and I started to use it. Uh, and all these years later, here I am with a career in software engineering. So. Um, I th think I'm quite lucky to have had that experience. So, um, what's the talk? Um, the talk, um, we're going to really um, explain some of the technical information, I suppose, about the journey towards building data fabric. Um, I'll explain what it is as well, and you'll get a sense of it in relation to other uh, platforms or service offerings, perhaps. Um, and I will do a live demonstration of Data Fabric in Action, um, just the basics of it, so you can get a sense of it rather than it just being uh, a bunch of boxes on a page. Um, it's actually a running system. Um, and then we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end, um, if uh, it all still remains a mystery. Um, I'm happy to deal with um, any questions that might come up. Um, so a little bit about the timeline. Um, we started the project. Um, uh, just two of us initially uh, in uh, towards the end of 2014 uh, and like most projects we got something into production or most successful projects at least we got something in pro into production within that magic sort of three month window um, and gradually um, uh, well, we continue to roll the system out um, and grow the team throughout 2015 uh, and into 2016 so uh, there's now 12 of us running the uh, development and support activities. Um, and as we move into 2017, we're now uh, the strategic data service uh, for use within NetWest Markets. Okay? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we've, uh, the development practices that we've adopted um, and how they've benefited us. Um, but really, it's about um, explaining the journey uh, of Data Fabric and how we got where we got. Um, so, um, just to set the scene a little bit, some of the background to um, this problem, maybe have a closer look at it. Um, these two diagrams that you can see are um, they're architecture diagrams. Um, they've been redacted a little bit for public consumption, um, but they're architecture diagrams of the investment bank. Um, and um, if you look at the one uh, on the top left, what you can see are uh, groups of systems grouped roughly by asset class. So when we talk about asset class in this industry, we might think of asset class about foreign exchange, perhaps another asset class around uh, interest rate trading or credit trading. Um, and some of these groupings you can see uh, roughly along, along asset class lines. Those are generally the sort of systems at, at the top. Uh, and then we've got sort of groupings of towards the bottom around more functional capabilities like settlements and confirmation. Um, some of the more um, fundamental processing activities that an investment bank needs to carry out. And down either side, you can see these kind of narrow bands that are attempts, uh, and, and often successful attempts, at, at um, shared services that um, should intersect those functional areas. Um, 
So what you can see from that diagram is hopefully clear that it's a pretty complex landscape inside an investment bank like um, NatWest Markets. Um, there are many thousands of applications that um, the technical function has to manage. Hundreds of them are business critical, mission critical, uh, in any given uh, time frame. Um, and there's all sorts of transfer mechanisms between them. Um, and then this other diagram on the right really just shows, um, on the bottom, uh, it just shows the data flows that can occur. Again, that's, when, that's been redacted, but it can show the data flows that occur within one specific functional area, um, which is about management of risk. Okay? Um, we've taken a lot of the, the, the crucial information off, but I've got that there really to show you, um, again, the kind of numbers of data flows that you might Im imagine exist in an investment bank. Uh, and each one of those different colors represents a slightly different mechanism for a data flow. Um, so we've got pretty much every mechanism, you know, if you want to uh, go through it um, after, uh, you know, the kind of, kind of history that um, an institution like ours has, we end up with um, a lot of different techniques uh, and a lot of different uh, platforms managing their data exchange in their own ways, um, which makes that, it makes an expensive operation to run um, and it can make tracking the lineage uh, of a piece of data uh, quite a challenge, okay? And we're increasingly under regulatory pressure in this industry to be able to report uh, effectively about uh, the lineage of our data. So um, when, we, when we report our particular position, uh, we need to know with confidence that uh, that information has been well reported all the way through these complex stacks. So um, this kind of sets the scene, I hope, a little bit um, about the kinds of data transfers that we might we might see and how complex the uh, engineering environment can be uh, in an investment bank. Um, and I think if you went across the industry, you would find uh, a very similar picture um, in most of the kind of institutions that operate in the way that RBS does. So, um, so to kind of summarize that a little bit more, um, we've, we've had really an evolution uh, over many, many years. Um, and our systems tend to uh, tend to align towards these asset class stacks, right? They tend to align in terms of ability to respond or a shorter term ability to respond to the pressures that uh, a department or an asset class uh, might place on the engineering uh, mechanisms in the system. So you end up with a lot of functional duplication. Uh, we end up with a lot of data duplication. Um, and then we end up with checks between these systems and balances to make sure that our data has been duplicated correctly. Um, which then makes lineage difficult and, it, and makes um, reporting more of a challenge, right? So we know we need to become leaner and more sustainable, so we're simplifying these platforms. We have to simplify them. Uh, and we know that we need to improve our data quality uh, in order to uh, get through some of these regulatory challenges around control and lineage. And we know that regulation is continually, uh, continuously becoming more and more strict. Um, and... So that was some of the context there. Um, so what are we doing about it? Uh, well, that's part of what Data Fabric is about. Um, so um, we're really trying to move from these uh, very siloed, very duplicate um, technology stacks uh, to rationalize the data layer underneath these applications. We have many thousands of applications within the investment bank. So um, the idea is that we provide a common API for these systems to use, um, and we tackle it um, with a multi-tenant platform as a service, okay, that addresses most of the kinds of common data problems that um, the applications that we're supporting would tend to, tend to experience. Right? Along the way, uh, we're reducing uh, the, the, the people costs and the systems costs. We get better data center utilization, smaller data center footprint, and uh, get some of the more modern application development features into the hands of our app teams and empower them to... Um, to work more effectively, right? And we raise the level of abstraction at which they work, okay? So that's a fairly common industry theme, I would think, um, and part of the way that we're doing it is with this platform we call Data Fabric, okay? So, yeah. So we'll just move on, and then let's just be a wee bit more specific. Um, so what do we mean by it? Well, we say our strap line, um, for clarity in our mission statement is that Data Fabric is there to provide data storage, query and distribution uh, as a service 
uh, enabling application developers to concentrate on business functionality. So that's that piece around raising that level of abstraction. Um, and this is, this is roughly the data fabric landing page that someone would see uh, internally within NatWest markets when they, when they come, and, come and meet us. So they get some sort of idea of um, the platform and the stack and the different layers of the system. So we've got that, that fairly you know, simple message around what data fabric is um, and some key features about it. So we talk about um, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability ratings of our platforms within um, NatWest markets. Uh, and Data Fabric is firmly a, a one 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 application, which means it's, it's as high as it can be in terms of those three uh, key, uh, key measures. Um, so it's about addressing that and addressing that once. It can be difficult to meet all of those requirements. There's some fairly lengthy policy documents, I can assure you, um, within that West Markets about meeting that kind of thing well. Um, so it's about doing that once um, for most of these the platforms that build on top of us. It's also about dealing with audit and authorization, so activity tracking and monitoring um, of um, data changes and, and uh, people's access. So it's providing one mechanism underneath um, uh, the applications for that. Um, dealing with resiliency and high availability and, and, and to, into data center um, stability as well. Um, so, and integrating with the bank's security systems, so to save people the effort of having to do that. Um, or even to remove the opportunity to perhaps do it in, in proprietary ways. Um, so those basic, those basic you know, um, resilience and availability pieces are there at the bottom. Um, and then above that, um, we start to, start to offer the kind of core features of Data Fabric, and we can see those in action in a minute. Um, but that's uh, for it to operate as a key value store um, that's searchable, um, that can deal with um, multi-terabyte data sets comfortably um, that doesn't impose the requirement to adopt upfront schema uh, on the development teams and will provide um, versioning and auditing, uh, as I say, um, as a core feature of the platform. And then alongside that, we provide um, uh, high-throughput messaging infrastructure describing change to that data set as it occurs. So um, there's the ability to build these kinds of platforms that may get an initial snapshot and a continuous stream of change and be able to switch seamlessly from dealing with the initial snapshot to moving against the, the continuous stream. Uh, so we call that a continuous query uh, or a watch, and we'll see that in action um, in a minute. Um, and then we also have a SQL-like query capability um, that sits alongside that. And then we wrap all that lot up with a service API um, and ship um, Java clients and C-sharp clients out um, to the development teams um, and, and manage that entire stack. So they really just take dependencies on these clients um, and, um, and we're abstracting all that capability and all the physical infrastructure behind the scenes. So um, that's what we think of it as. Um, and I think it's a fairly bounded definition. So, um, so let's um, move on and we can start to think a little bit more specifically about some of the the core technologies that we've used to get this off the ground. Um, it's a Java conference, as people uh, seem to be routinely stressing within their talks. Um, and obviously, this is a Java platform. Um, and we're very comfortable with Java 1.8. Uh, we've been running with Java 1.8 from the start. Um, and obviously, that's been very successful for us. Um, we, we work with an open source bias, OK? That's just. Uh, a value that we adopted at the start of the project. Um, and generally, we find that that stuff is easier for developers to learn. They tend to be a little bit more exposed to it uh, increasingly. And we find that the open source community is naturally more transparent about problems than the vendor community tends to be. Um, so that's good for us. We've got a strong development capability, and we can collaborate um, quite effectively like that. So we, we have this bias, um, and we generally found that Working with that bias, uh, open source pieces are tending to integrate more naturally with one another um, in, a, in, a, in a smooth way. Um, so we like that. Um, we also like the, the wide adoption, uh, the, uh, the community, and the endorsement that a community can give a product or, a, or an open source platform. Uh, I think I tend to favor that over the, um, the rhetoric that we sometimes hear from salespeople and so on. So if, if there's uh, community adoption out there, then that's, um, that's a good bias for us. Um, and, and preferring pieces that are 
under active development. Um, again, that makes it easier for people to, to get on board. Um, another bias, I suppose, in our choice is that um, some, of the, some enterprise platforms can get staggeringly expensive. Um, and with an open source bias, things aren't, uh, they can need to be a bit cheaper um, in general. Uh, we do have a development capability, and we need to take that advantage of that, as I say. Um, so, um, but that can help us reduce our licensing costs a little bit um, over a typical enterprise platform. So, um, at least that's been effective today. Um, so, some of these technologies there, the, the diagrams, you know, the, the, the icons are, um, are up there, but you know, Zookeeper's been uh, a very key piece um, that we use for distributed coordination. Um, and that's been, that's been stable and effective from the very start, uh, paired with um, Curator, Net, the Netflix Curator library. Um, they've done an excellent job with that, as well as with the um, exhibitor that sits, um, sits in front of the piece. Um, obviously, MongoDB is in there uh, as a core storage technology. I think that'll start to become clear. Um, and we pair that up with Apache Kafka um, for uh, the distributed messaging side. Right? So those three pieces, really, um, are the, are the kind of key three bits. Um, and we tie that all together, of course, with Java 8. Uh, and we run it within just um, a Java SE um, uh, service container that um, we built in-house. Um, it's a very, very lightweight service container and packaging piece um, that we've been able to automate the deployment of using Puppet um, quite effectively. Um, and so all that lot runs on, um, on Red Hat, um, on physical tin internally. So. Um, it's, um, yeah, Puppet's been effective too. So those pieces, um, and we get an idea of the kind of abstractions that sit there um, and the kind of layers. Um, we have these two core concepts in Data Fabric of uh, commands and events, uh, where a command is a piece of data that expresses an intent to get something done, and an event is a piece of data that uh, describes the occurrence of something happening. Okay. All of those things are uh, loggable uh, and, and auditable and traceable. Um, and our API immediately moves from an imperative API into um, something that adopts the command pattern and will, um, uh, it, and hence is, is recordable and trackable all the way through the system. So, um, so that sets um, the scene a little bit, I suppose, in terms of the, the, the technology stack. Um, and then just a little bit, about how we've done this uh, and our development approach internally. Um, some of the behaviors that we've, ad we've adopted um, that, have, um, that have led to us getting this system into production in what can be a difficult environment sometimes, um, as I'm sure everyone would, would sympathize with. Um, so our, our bias, as I said, as I've said around, is internal so open source in, um, in terms of bringing things in from the community, but we've also adopted that practice internally. So um, we try not to be walled in terms of our development, and we've accepted uh, change and pull requests and been very open about um, the source within the organization um, from the very start, really adopted that, um, that, that mindset. Um, the, and I guess the idea about integration architecture, and that's about reusing all the pieces that um, have already been uh, developed. We've adopted, we've accepted contributions from uh, the internal development community, um, and we run a two-week development cycle, okay, um, with a continuous automated testing stack around it. Um, so that that's meant that we've been able to do um, 42 releases of Data Fabric into the production environment since when we started back in 2015. So um, using, you know just being able to rely on the quality of our automated testing. Um, so that's, you know, th that's the regular build and, and, and integration testing that you'd see within um, you know, Team City setup or something like that. But also we've got a, a simulation system that will run with um, a compute grid behind it that's continuously simulating um, the kind of workloads that we expect from test and production systems. Um, and so that's, that's really been very key to us getting the kind of change cadence and the kind of confidence in our um, development practices um, is that um, that agility. Um, and one of the other pieces that we've adopted from the start is um, semantic versioning. Um, that requires some human interaction, obviously. That's not something we've been able to automate. 
uh, but that's helped us considerably um, manage, especially manage the, the number of different client versions that we've got out there, uh, and with respect to client compatibility against um, the server versions that happen to be running. So um, adopting Semver earlier on was, um, was definitely um, a, worthwhile, uh, a worthwhile practice. So yeah, a little bit about that. Um, and then we can see a bit more in depth about um, the, the architecture of the platform. I can just explain some of this stuff a bit more. Um, so obviously, we've talked about client libraries, and we've talked about Netty. Uh, or we've touched on Netty. Netty's been very effective um, at implementing the custom binary protocol that we have in front of Data Fabric. Um, Netty's fabulous for that in Java, uh, if you want to implement binary protocols. Um, it's, um, it's an excellent piece. Um, that's worked beautifully from the start, and it's worked very well in terms of man managing version compatibility. Um, so we've done 42 releases of this platform, um, and we haven't done and, and kept, I think, binary compatibility uh, with most of the API all the way back to version one point something, um, and we're on four and a bit now. So um, Netty's implementation of binary protocols has been very useful. So that's that's really how we ab uh, we abstract the platform. Um, and um, get work in and out and data streams um, in and out of clients. Um, we obviously run clusters. It's a clustered application, it's a clustered platform. We run MongoDB clusters, of course, um, many of them behind the command server abstraction layer. Uh, we run Zookeeper clusters, uh, and we run Kafka clusters uh, that use those Zookeeper clusters, of course, as well. Um, and we run those across multiple data centers, and we'll see that topology in a minute. Um, but, um, and you know, we, we use curators, as I've said, uh, in there, uh, working well in terms of dealing with things like session management, in terms of things like leadership election, uh, and distributed singletons, uh, in terms of distributed locks and coordination patterns, and for managing small amounts of state data that the cluster needs to share. Um, Zookeeper's excellent at that. Of course, Kafka is distributed um, high throughput messaging platform. People will have seen uh, that before. Um, working in, you know, in partnership with Zookeeper as well. Um, and so uh, our Java service container sits there and abstracts all these technologies uh, behind its, its custom binary protocol. Okay? Um, we've had good success with um, Splunk. Um, as a, a log logging and aggregation platform. Uh, we talked about audit and we talked about um, tracking activity. Um, Smoke's been very good for that. Um, and yeah, I've mentioned Puppet as well there. So that gives you a rough idea of the kinds of, um, the kinds of uh, technology that, that's, that's laid out, how it works. Um, from the beginning, we've put all these technologies against their own private 10 gigabit ethernet. Um, with a public one gigabit ethernet in front of it that talks to uh, the bank's um, shared network. Uh, and most of these clustered pieces will communicate uh, and bind to uh, your private you know, backside 10 gigabit um, networking so that they generally have pretty stable um, inter-cluster communications, um, which for many of these systems is kind of, kind of important. Um, it's, it can get can get unpleasant if um, members of these clusters fall out. Um, but we've been able to manage that um, reasonably well so far. Um, so that's, that's kind of the layout of the, of the platform. Um, and then just to, just to go a little bit further in terms of topology. Um, so Data Fabric runs in, well, two and a bit data centers. Um, we have data centers that uh, we run internally within NatWest markets. Um, and generally, this is how, how we arrange things. Um, so we've got high availability across these data centers, and we've been through um, several rounds of DR testing through this, failing back and forward with um, pretty small um, failover times, um, generally in the sort of seconds, um, is what we tend to see. Um, so we tend to run it. Uh, like this, we'll run it in two data centers for uh, storage. Um, so there are operational clusters and backup clusters that are split in roughly the same sorts of ways. Uh, they'll obviously talk 10 gig within the data centers, and then they'll use a shared link that operates between our data centers. Um, and then they'll use one gig out to the front of everyone else. Um, and then we'll use usually arbiters in a third data center 
Uh, we've put the MongoDB arbiters in here, uh, but we're also doing that for Zookeeper. Uh, and in due course, we'll end up with um, Kafka data replicated out to the third data center as well. Um, so this means that we can lose a data center without any interruption to service or without any manual uh, um, activity required for the data to be both read and write um, uh, available. Um, so um, I'm aware that you know there are lots of these kinds of architectures out there, um, but obviously as an investment bank, um, we are uh, we're required to perform this kind of engineering in-house typically. Um, rather than being able to go out to third-party providers for it, um, usually driven by uh, an element of regulatory pressure. So, um, so yeah, that um, um, gives you an idea of the kind of topology that's, that's, that's involved. Um, so we're coming to the, uh, the demo shortly, but um, just a little bit more here about quite what Data Fabric is and Beeson's role in it. Um, it's the ability to unify these two concepts of enumerable and observable. Um, it was one of the core ideas behind Data Fabric. Um, and that's to bring together Mongo and Apache Kafka as implementations of those two pieces. Um, obviously, there are other choices in, 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 in all of those, uh, in both of those spheres. Um, but we've adopted Beeson as the, uh, the storage and uh, interchange format for Data Fabric. Um, so it's, it's the same, okay? So we know that we can persist data in Beeson format, and we know that we can stream exactly that data set through Kafka without any transformation. Uh, we know that we can bind serializers, the same serializers, to the data at rest uh, as the data in, uh, in transit, okay? And, and using Beeson uh, as, a, as a single data interchange format and storage format um, allows, us to, um, allows us to work that way. Um, and it allows us, and we'll see this in a very basic sense in a minute, but it allows us to uh, pass the query through the data in the traditional enumerable model, and it also allows us to pass the data through the query in the observable model, okay? Um, so, obviously, you might be fairly familiar with technologies like Mongo and how they would, uh, you might choose, you might, you, might, you might imagine being able to rewrite a query into, into Mongo language or, um, you know, serialize in and out of technologies like that. A little bit more to do to get things like Kafka to play with those kinds of um, queries. Um, and for that, we've used um, a little bit of language rewrite that, um, that we, we implemented using Antler. Um, so Antler's an open source language recognition tool uh, and um, parser generator. And so using a parser generator for SQL using Antler uh, means that we can rewrite these things out to groovy expressions, okay? And a groovy expression uh, can sit there and be uh, run on the fly inside our application servers and perform the basics of things like filtering and projection uh, of uh, the data stream as it passes through Kafka, okay? Um, so, but we'll see that in work, at work in a minute. Um, but, you know, Data Fabric's able to unify these two ideas, um, which is often a very core cool thing um, for the kinds of investment bank use cases that we, that we find. Uh, the classics are um, traders blotters in, um, you know, on, a, on a trading screen. You can imagine getting the current state, looking at where we are now, and watching that tick for changes. That's a, con that's a continuous problem that people face um, in, um, in investment banking. Um, so we're very well set up to deal with that. Again, p things like position calculation, how do we get you know, some current state into some other service, run a bunch of compute over that, and then watch for asynchronous notifications uh, in order to keep positions up to date and report them um, report them in a, in a timely way. Um, and, I, and the other piece, I suppose, um, is about driving a change to the bank's architecture. Um, we, talk, we, we looked earlier on at that, uh, that diagram that showed um, the flows, the data, you remember that one with all the different data flows? And there's lots of batch copying of that data set around. And Data Fabric's there to provide a mechanism to provide streams so that people don't need to take uh, intraday or, or even end of day bulk copies of data. They can get this continuous stream of change uh, and, and react to it. So it's about providing a mechanism to allow the bank to become more event-based and less batch-based, right? And, and, you know, these two technologies tie together quite well with Beeson um, and tie those two ideas together quite well uh, in, um, in Data Fabric. So, um, so that's that. Um, and so what I'll do now is I'm aware that 
uh, we want to do a bit of a demonstration. What I'll do now is um, we'll show the basics of Data Fabric at work, um, and um, yeah, hopefully this diagram shows you a little bit of what we might be doing. So we're going back to uh, Data Fabric, which is running inside the NatWest Markets data centers. Uh, we're going to use a console application to see it in action, okay? So, now the fun starts, right? Um, now then, what do I do? So, here we are, good. Now, um, what we're seeing here is uh, some fairly black, empty screens. This application is the Data Fabric shell, okay? It's uh, an application that we use internally. We use it from command line environments like Autosys, uh, and we use it from, you know, really any, any uh, we use it for support of the platform and for demonstration of the platform, right? Um, most of our clients use the Java and C-sharp APIs to deal directly with Data Fabric, but for here, we can do something interactive with the shell, uh, and that might be a bit of fun. Um, it's, uh, the shell itself might be of interest to Java developers. It uses the Nashorn JavaScript engine that came with um, Java 1.8. Um, I think you probably want to go somewhere after update 66. Um, and it uses JLine, which is uh, an open source Java line processing uh, and console input handling library. And it also uses JANSI, which is a, a piece to deal with escape codes, uh, ANSI escape codes in consoles. So we can do things like colorization, uh, which you'll see in, at work in a minute. And we also use Antler Grammars for uh, ECMAScript, for JavaScript, and for JSON itself, so that we can parse uh, the, uh, the, the JavaScript as it comes in and execute it statement-wise. And we can also look for grammar errors in the JavaScript, and we can format the output uh, in a nice way. So now then, let's do the fun bit. Um, the other bit might have been fun as well, I don't know. But, um, so. Um, the first thing we'll say is, um, I'm just going to walk through this step by step. The first thing we'll say is, uh, let's just think of a database. Um, so it's, this is a, a managed platform where you haven't, you, you haven't called anyone to set this database up. Um, you haven't had to fill out any forms. Um, we, can just, we can just start to think of a database, and we can use one of the shared clusters that's behind the scenes. OK, so for the purposes of our demo, we'll think of a database called uh, J Prime, J Prime Demo, and I've just dropped it. I've just dropped anything that's already there um, so that um, we can start from a nice clean st uh, state. And what we can see is the shell here evaluating the JavaScript as I go. Um, so what I've done here is I've just loaded for the sake, for the purposes of a demonstration, um, some region data. I've got hold of some JSON data about regions, um, and I've loaded it from a file into an object, and we can see that that has 249 elements in it. Um, and um, we can look at the first element, and we find that you know, Afghanistan is region zero. Right? Um, thankfully, it's sorted alphabetically. And that's our region data. So it's got, crucially, these alpha 2 codes and alpha 3 codes, um, just for the purpose of this demonstration. Um, so what we'll do is we'll then map that within the shell. So again, this is just some JavaScript running here. Um, we'll map it, and I've now taken that um, that list, and I've mapped it by that alpha 2 code, OK? So I've now got a map of regions. So I've looked up uh, that region's map by, um, by the alpha 2 code for Bulgaria, and there we are. We've got some information about Bulgaria, OK? Um, so, so far, we've just been dealing with JSON, and we've been dealing with uh, the shell. Um, and now I have another operation. Now, I'll drop a collection uh, in our database called regions, just so that we can start from a clean state. And I'll upsert that regions map into Data Fabric's regions collection, OK? And I, it's, uh, it's telling me, thank you, I've upserted 249 uh, documents into this regions collection, OK? And of course, we can then do a uh, key value lookup of those regions. We said it was a key value store. It is a key value store um, around, uh, oriented around Beeson. And so we do key value lookup, and we can see uh, Bulgaria, and we can see my home nation, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland. Okay? Um, map, again, mapped by Alpha 2, uh, but this time pulled back from that region's collection. Okay? That's the basics. Um, then we, we can perform this function that we call scan. Okay? Um, and I think I've got something wrong. Um, oh, sorry. We can perform a function called scan. Um, so scan doesn't require an index, okay? I won't cover indexes. 
Uh, I'll take that little piece out because I made a mistake there. Sorry. Um, I, won't, uh, I won't cover indexes, but scan will run. And it, uh, it doesn't require an index. Uh, and obviously, that can deal with a very small amount of data generally. Uh, and there are all sorts of APIs around adding indexes uh, into Data Fabric, and they're crucial in terms of query performance. Um, but you know, we can run a scan, um, and we can get some search results uh, around uh, regions that are in Eastern Europe. Okay, um, so there we are. We see those, uh, and they make sense. So we got off the ground very quickly. Okay, this shell uh, reflects the. Um, the Java API underneath, um, and we're able to start to operate immediately. We haven't had to, uh, we haven't had to phone anyone. And if we look a little bit more closely at that scan expression, um, we can see um, a little bit of the SQL syntax on the, um, that Data Fabric adopts. Um, we have, um, I can keep building this where expression up, uh, and that's actually a SQL conformant where expression, and equally the select expression. I can keep building that up. Um, and we know that because we use um, SQL grammars to parse and rewrite these things uh, internally within Data Fabric. Um, so then our next piece, uh, we have um, some. Um, we have this piece around a near cache. Okay, so we talked about Zookeeper. Um, well, um, Data Fabric can perform near caching of its data in a true, in a basic read and write through way using Apache Ignite. Uh, as it's near cache at the moment, uh, but that cache is a choice, of course. Um, and here I've just looked for a region's cache, um, and I've asked for it to, to near cache that region's collection within this JVM that um, the shell is, is running, of course. And I can go to that region's cache, and again, I can get it by uh, these alpha two codes. Um, and that's, you know, that's obviously um, if it's a, uh, a fetch just within the JVM, then you can imagine the kind of um, get latencies that you'd expect from that. If it has to go back to Data Fabric, then typically the get latencies are sort of in the low numbers of milliseconds. Um, obviously, it depends on the size of the result that comes back, but um, generally sort of millisecond get latencies with Data Fabric. So, um, so I'm just going to switch over to another shell instance here. This is a, here's one that's, uh, that's empty that doesn't know anything about what's going on. And we're going to um, just, we're going to see that, you know, thanks to, um, the, the Zookeeper clusters that are behind the scenes and Ignite's use of the Zookeeper Discovery SPI, the piece that it uses to find uh, other members of the cluster. Uh, this other shell uh, can you know, look at that region's cache straight away and um, what we'll see, and if you look for the first example here, we'll see uh, there's an absent field, okay? Bulgaria doesn't have a capital field, so if I print that out and it tells me that capital is null. So these, these, these near caches are linked uh, and they're linked using um, uh, they're linked using Zookeeper. So um, here we are in the other instance. Um, I'm now going to mutate that document, uh, and I'm going to put it back into the cache. Uh, and I've declared a capital property on that uh, Bulgaria instance, and uh, I've put it back into the cache. And, and there's our capital city has been declared. And of course, if I drop back now to, um, to my first shell, and I repeat, and I move on to the next piece, uh, I'm going to get that object back from the cache. And uh, thankfully, it's going to tell me that the Capital City is Sophia. So, so two caches are replicated um, and, and, and kept in sync thanks to, um, thanks to um, Ignite, and they discover one another through Zookeeper. Okay? So, um, so we've got near caching, we've got read and write through, we've got searching. Um, uh, there are obviously indexes, but we don't cover those today. Uh, and we've got near caches uh, that are read and write through in front of those things. Okay? Um, so let's carry on. Um, and we'll say, uh, I'm going to do a little bit more uh, in this other shell instance here. And I've loaded some, some data describing uh, airports, OK? Uh, airports around the world. And I've mapped those, uh, rather like I mapped the region data within this shell, I've mapped those by the IATA code of the airport. So uh, here we have SOF. Uh, and again, we can look up that map internally. Um, and we can see some information, thankfully, about Sofia Airport. And um, so that's that. Um, and the next step is we'll do uh, a little bit more. And I'm going to decorate that data with data from the region cache, OK? So um, what's happened there is um, I've run through the, um, the airports. And for each uh, region, I've pulled in its, um, 
Uh, sorry, for each airport, I've pulled in its um, region data from the region cache based on the ISO code of the airport, okay? And then we map that, so now we can see uh, a little bit more. We can see uh, the airport itself, and we can see what region it's in. And that's been denormalized. Uh, and then we've persisted that lot back um, into um, that airport's collection. So we've now got a little bit more data um, associated with each one. Um, so if I just um, run the next piece, uh, this demo we'll see. Uh, I go back and I can do that key value lookup, of course, again, and, and thankfully there's uh, Sophia in the underlying collection, not in the cache, in the underlying collection, which is written through, uh, and we can see that it has region data decorated on it. Um, so we'll show one more piece, uh, and this is about um, how the watches work. Okay, uh, so this is streaming data through Kafka. Um, so here we are, we'll find uh, a list of, uh, in the shell, uh, we'll use a scan function, again, another, uh, another predicate here, um, in the kind of syntax you'd expect, um, to find all the airports in, in Northern Europe, okay, where the subregion is Northern Europe, and we have uh, 357 of them. So I'm gonna flip back to my, my other shell now. Uh, this is the other instance, of course, and we're just gonna set up this piece in the shell called a watch, okay? Uh, and the watch um, looks, if anyone's used Rx, as I mentioned, or at least Rx was on the slide earlier on, or observables, we're familiar with that. Well, we have a very uh, observable-like piece within JavaScript here that just reflects what's in the API underneath uh, in Java that's an on-next, non-error subscriber for the watch. Okay, uh, and I'm going to create a watch now uh, against a collection that doesn't exist yet. Um, if we can see that, um, we can see uh, we have a watch in this, um, in this session. It's durable. Uh, it's against that database, and it's against this collection. And we can see the, the, the where expression and the select expression that's associated with that watch, okay? Um, and so far, it doesn't have an ID, okay? Because it isn't, uh, isn't running. So I'm gonna ask Data Fabric to run that watch, and off it goes. It's gonna come back in a second. Um, so it's done that. Um, and it's given me back an ID for the watch, and it says it's, uh, it says it's durable, so I mentioned that. Um, and I just saved the watch for later to a collection called Watches so that I can tidy up after myself when I'm done, which is always good practice. And if I drop back to the first shell instance now, uh, what I'm gonna do is create a bunch of journeys, okay? And these are just journeys between uh, Sofia and anywhere in Northern Europe. So we take all the Northern Euro European airports, uh, we iterate over them, and for each one of them we insert um, into the journeys collection in Data Fabric um, a, a record that just describes you know point A to point B, right? Um, and if I um, if I drop back now to my other instance, of course, what I've seen is I've seen if you can if you can figure this out um, an asynchronous delivery uh, of um, a journey where the destination IATA is in. LHR, so we can see the destination IATA is in LHR there, so that's our journey of those 357 journeys that we inserted. We can see that you know, that one, uh, so the predicate has matched and the projection has occurred, and, and Data Fabric's provided me with that, that um, nice view of the data. Okay, um, so um, these watches are durable, as I've said, so I'm gonna drop this, drop out of this shell, um, and that second instance, so what do I mean by durable? Uh, that means that if you go away, we'll carry on delivering the data, okay? So I'm gonna insert some more data from this first shell instance. You know, your process goes offline, you, you crash, you reboot, whatever. Um, data Fabric's still there in the background for you, delivering these data, uh, this data into the appropriate Kafka topics um, so that you can resume from either where you left off or somewhere prior in the, um, in the stream. So we come back in and we'll see, uh, I'll restart that shell. And if I just come back, now I've got these pieces here. Now I just need to do a little bit. Uh, and so the little bit I'll do in this shell instance, of course, is um, I'll just tell it, um, you can just see that the ID of the watch that we saved, it's just something that um, is just there for good order and I redeclare the subscriber so that I know uh, within this um, JavaScript shell how to call back and send the data back, okay. So if I resume this watch, um, I can just tell it um, about, um, 
about that ID. And of course, once I've resumed the watch, it has then delivered uh, the data that I persisted while we were looking away earlier on. Okay? Um, so that's asynchronous change delivery. Um, it watches. That's how we unify um, the, uh, the syntax between um, select and where's and, 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 uh, and the like. Uh, and that's Beeson uh, at work, both as a, uh, a static representation of the data and as a data in transit. Okay? Um, so the very last thing I'll do, just for good order, is I'll remove that watch uh, from, uh, from here. And um, yeah, and we're done. So that's, that's kind of the basics of data fabric. Just interactively, we can see it running. Um, and hopefully a little bit about the kinds of core capabilities of the system. There's, there's a fair bit more to say. Um, but um, I've only got four minutes. So, um, yeah. Um, so we'll just drop back. Um, so that's my, that's my demo. Um, and I'll come back to the end and I'll resume my slideshow. So just, just to just talk about some of the, the things that we'll do next. Uh, obviously, the team continues. Um, um, we'll continue to onboard systems. Uh, that's a continuous process for us. Uh, um, I think we're running... Um, yeah, well, it, it, the numbers the numbers I don't have right now, but they're constantly growing. Um, we're working on making the system's ACID characteristics um, a little bit more uh, uh, more mature, um, and so there'll be there'll be further pieces in there around read and write isolation uh, in due course. Um, we're working on stream materialization, um, so that's about um, being able to provide. Um, reporting oriented views of the data set, but have confidence that we um, we have a complete view of those data uh, of that data for reporting purposes, but also I think around being able to join multiple streams um, and uh, and materialize the results of joins um, so that's that, that's in flight um, but um, more to come on that we're working again with JDBC access to the data, um, especially on the read side uh, and the ability to integrate with um, is reporting tools like Spotfire um, and um, and the like, um, and uh, it's our ambition certainly to open source the platform. Um, so we'll start with that um, in in due course. I hope um, there are some pieces, especially around um, validation, um, JSON schema validation, that are of interest in that space. But um, so get in touch if you're interested in um, what Data Fabric's about. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so I've got a couple of minutes for any questions, if anything comes to mind. Um, I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. So what are the architectural requirements in regard to availability, reliability, latency? Okay. Um, architectural requirements ours. Yes, in the... Um, okay, well, that, that's a, there's a, a fairly long list of those. Um, um, Essentially, um, uh, more on the order. What's the, the the top five priorities, and in which order? Is okay. it the uh, integrity or reliability or the latency? Um, I'd, I'd say we could probably deal with latency later, or, or toward, look further down that list. I'd probably put integrity integrity at the top, and availability pretty next, pretty close up behind integrity. Uh, we can deal with a little bit more in terms of eventual consistency. Uh, and latency in terms of um, in terms of read throughput a little bit more. I think our writes generally um, we have um, it depends on the use case for the application platform as well. Some of them are, are different, um, but as a, as a, for the core features of Data Fabric, um, people put out, they're really putting their trust in us in terms of integrity and availability. So. I have more questions oh, sure. if there's no one else. <laughs> so uh, you're using Curl hardware. On, with Linux, you are not using containers or virtual machines. Not at the moment. Um, that's something that we're uh, actively looking at. Uh, but yeah, it all runs on physical kit at the minute. Yeah. But um, yeah, we use Puppet to help with that coordination. Um, so yeah, but we're, we're actively looking at that. I have more. <laughs> You've got more questions. Okay. Yeah, two more. Uh, so, do you plan on using reactive streams uh, and reactor? Uh, as a backend, and have the you know the back pressure and on error handling. You're asking me about back pressure and where back pressure sits within the yeah, architecture, within or within the data fabric. Yeah. Sorry, how do we deal with it? Yeah. Um, 
mostly with Netty. Um, Netty offers uh, pieces around um, uh, socket writability and channel writability. Um, if you look into that, uh, there are some pieces there. Um, generally, we rely on Netty's channel writability status to deal with that. So it's about socket buffers being full and consumers not being able to pull out of socket buffers. And how do you trace the calls? Uh, you use Splunk for the logging, uh, but do you use another distributed logging or tracing mechanisms? Do we use any other distributed logging mechanisms other than Splunk? Yeah. No. Uh, and the tracing, it, it, pop, it goes down to the tracing the logs uh, and not using some tracing system. It's all just done through log aggregation from the file system and the Splunk forwarders. Yeah. Uh, 